ago, I sat in my clinic talking with one of my patients. She'd had some weight loss and had developed a new cough, and I had to give her the diagnosis that she had lung cancer. And so I'm personally looking forward to hearing all that you have to say about new treatments. Our first speaker is Dr. Renato Machins. He tells me this is how it's pronounced uh, in Brazil. He's an associate professor of oncology here at the University of Washington School of Medicine. He works at our Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, and he has been the medical director since 2004 of the thoracic head and neck section, and since 2008, he's actually been medical director of all of their outpatient clinics. He received his medical degree in Rio and Brazil. He then moved to the States where he completed his internship and residency in internal medicine, he stayed on at Harvard, where he received his master's degree in public health. He then completed his fellowship in hematology and oncology at Massachusetts. We lost him back to Brazil at that time, after he completed his fellowship. He returned to Brazil, and he was chief of medical oncology at the Brazilian National Cancer Institute. We were lucky enough to sway him away, and he moved to Seattle in 2004. His current research interest relates to the treatment of many types of cancers, but specifically cancers of the lung, the neck, and the head. He coordinates a lot of clinical trials, most of them related to treatment, and he has numerous scientific publications and book chapters. In addition to this, he's a compassionate clinician. He has a warm sense of humor. His scientific work is of the highest caliber. And on top of all this, he tells me that he is an avid squash player and he is ranked in the area. So please welcome Dr. Machtins. Well, thank you all for coming. So we will talk today about uh, lung cancer and I promise that this will not be a painful um, enumeration of uh, uh, chemotherapy agents uh, and the numbers that are, uh, for the most part, meaningless. I will try to do this uh, in the uh, most uh, interesting and engaging way. So that's what we're fighting. This is a patient with a chest x-ray and a very large uh, mass in the left lung. One of the problems on the diagnosis of lung cancer is that the lung tissue doesn't hurt so something can grow to a very uh, a significant size before it causes uh, symptoms. And for this reason, unfortunately, most patients with lung cancer are diagnosed in a fairly advanced stage of their disease. Um, the title uh, was uh, Lung Cancer Being a Self-Inflicted Disease for the Most Part. Um, one of the problems is that uh, lung cancer doesn't get as much funding uh, exactly because it's considered a self-inflicted disease. Well, you got lung cancer, it's your fault, you smoke all your life. Uh, what's interesting is that uh, most people start smoking when they are teenagers and if they had committed a crime, they probably wouldn't even be tried as adults. Um, but they seem to be responsible for becoming addicted to cigarettes when they are teenagers. No one deserves lung cancer, and no one is to be faulted by having lung cancer. It is true, however, that cigarettes are by far the most common uh, cause of lung cancer. And for smokers that have smoked approximately a pack a day for more than 25 years, the increased risk of lung cancer is about 20 times as someone that has never smoked. Um, there is a lot of talk about secondhand smoke, but while cigarettes, being a, an active smoker, increase the chance by 20 times, uh, having secondhand exposure increased by 1.2 times 
So you can see that the magnitude there is, is uh, very different. And uh, random um, asbestos, environmental pollution, and familial lung cancer are responsible for a much, much smaller percentage of cases of uh, lung cancer, although probably environmental pollution has uh, more uh, of a role. So now back to when people start smoking. Um, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. And uh, um, you can see that that's a and, uh, really old advertisement, probably from the 1940s to 1950s. The doctor, uh, actually, uh, it says there, everybody knows him because uh, he is leaving in the middle of the night to do house calls. Well, those don't happen very often anymore. Um, but uh, um, it, this advertisement also shows that the tobacco industry would stop at nothing, including to bring the doctors into reason for people to smoke. Um, I think the AMA today wouldn't be very happy with that uh, advertisement, that's for sure. Uh, this is a, a, a slide that shows um, the percentage of uh, basically teenagers that uh, um, begin um, smoking in the United States from 1940 to 2000. And as you can see, uh, shortly after uh, 1940, you know, during um, the immediate period after the war, uh, it was as high as 7% uh, per year of uh, basically teenagers uh, that uh, start smoking. And unfortunately, we have uh, decreased this now to less than 3%, and uh, we um, were able to avoid this peak here uh, in the mid-1990s, where it seemed to be going up again, uh, unfortunately, but that trend, again, has been uh, fortunately reversed. Um, so the lung cancer incidence uh, among non-smokers um, between ages 40 and 79. Uh, among males, so these again are non-smokers, is 4.8 per 100,000 uh, people in the U.S. And among females, it's uh, actually much more common, uh, 20.8 per 100,000. Well, how does that compare with other diseases? Cervical cancer is 15 Point four per 100,000. So there are actually more non-smoker women diagnosed with lung cancer than diagnosed with cervical cancer. And if you look at uh, uh, female thyroid cancer, uh, it's also uh, less than uh, um, the incidence of uh, females that uh, are diagnosed with lung cancer and are non-smokers because there are approximately 200,000 people diagnosed each year in the U.S. with lung cancer, um, despite the fact that the percentage of non-smokers is between 15, 10 or 15 percent, it still represents a very sizable number of 20,000 plus uh, that are diagnosed each year with lung cancer and are non-smokers. These are the um, uh, U.S. trends in um, incidence um, and death uh, secondary to lung cancer from 1975 to 2005. And as you can see, um, in males, it start to go down uh, in mid-1990s. And in females, was going up consistently, but now has fortunate to level off. And the most recent data actually shows some uh, downward trend as well fortunately. Um, however, again, these are cases per 100,000. And although one can look at these numbers and, and uh, be led to believe that uh, there are less cases of lung cancer, that is actually not true. The cases just now may be leveling off, but they continue to go up through the 1990s and early 2000 because there are more people in the country. So although the incidence per 100,000 has gone down, if we have more 100,000s, then the total numbers uh, uh, continue to go up. And in fact, uh, this is age standardized trends in, in lung cancer. And I thought that it would be important to put the data from Washington State specifically, where there is a 2.5% decrease in the incidence of lung cancer. 
but because the population in the Washington state has gone up, the absolute numbers of lung cancer in this state have gone down for approximately 1% per year. Lung cancer is divided in two diseases, non-small cell and small cell carcinoma. Non-small cell is 85% of all cases of lung cancer. It's divided in different histology types, adenocarcinoma, squamous cell, large cell carcinoma. Has a slower growth pattern, not that it's a, a, a disease that is friendly at all, but has a slower growth pattern um, in a more stepwise progression where you have a tumor that grows and then goes to the lymph nodes inside of the lung tissue, then goes to the lymph nodes in the space between the two lungs and eventually disseminates throughout the body. And the primary curative therapy for this disease is surgical removal of the tumor. Small cell carcinoma uh, represents approximately 15% of all cases of lung cancer. It used to be 25, then went down to 20, and now it's down to 15, and that probably has to do with filters in cigarette and the type of, of carcinogens that are present in the uh, cigarettes nowadays. Almost 100% uh, are related with uh, tobacco exposure. In fact, it's incredibly rare to have someone with small cell that does not have a smoking history. And it tends to spread through the body very early in its natural history. In fact, the vast majority of patients present already with uh, widespread metastatic disease. When cure is possible, the disease is relatively localized, the primary curative therapy is a combination of chemo and radiation therapy. How do you make the diagnosis of lung cancer? Um, as it was said, I am uh, uh, from Brazil, and their uh, cost is a very important aspect of healthcare. The cheapest way of establishing the diagnosis of lung cancer is through spironocytology. Someone comes to your clinic, they have a productive cough, you ask them to cough in a cup, and you send to the cytology lab. And in fact, sometimes you can establish the diagnosis just like that. You can also perform a bronchoscopy, which is a procedure that a camera goes inside the lung, looks for the tumor, or for the area where the tumor uh, is likely to be, and then biopsies are performed. You can also have a CT-guided biopsy of that tumor that we saw in the second slide, um, and that is done guided by a CT scan. You put a needle inside the tumor and you remove a piece of it. And finally, another way of establishing the diagnosis is through uh, something called mediastinoscopy, which is a surgical procedure that you get between the two lungs and you remove one of the lymph nodes. And if that's affected by the tumor, then you will establish the diagnosis as well. For non-small cell lung cancer, the staging, and that's a very uh, simplified but um, more than adequate staging system for the disease. It divides in stages one, two, three, and four. Stage 1A is when you have a tumor that is less than three centimeters. Stage 1B is when you have a tumor that is more than three centimeters. Um, stage two, when you have lymph nodes that are involved inside of the lung tissue. And stage three, when you have lymph nodes that uh, are in the space between the two lungs or the mediastinal that can be in the same side of the tumor or contralateral to the tumor. The distinction between the possibility of cure uh, from a surgical standpoint is probably somewhere between stage two and three A, depending on the degree of involvement of this space between the two lungs. Patients that have stage three B are hardly ever considered for a surgical resection, and for the most part are treated with a combination of chemo and radiation therapy, as you see. And when patients have stage four disease, which indicates systemic spreading of the tumor throughout the body, they are treated with the intent of palliating their symptoms and prolonging their lives uh, with chemotherapy. Small cell, it's a simpler staging system that it's divided only in limited stage and extensive stage. Limited stage is when uh, one can fit all the tumor inside of what's called a reasonable radiation field, and there is no definition of that. Perhaps uh, um, reasonable is uh, how creative the radiation oncologist uh, is, and what's you know, feasible in terms of the amount of lung tissue that would have to be radiated. 
But unfortunately, most patients presented with extensive stage disease, um, and, and those are treated with uh, uh, chemotherapy only, with, again, the intent of controlling their tumor. How do we stage? How do we find how extensive a tumor is? Um, I would think that nowadays almost everybody gets a CT scan of chest and uh, upper abdomen, and that includes the liver and the adrenal glands, which are two sites that the disease uh, frequently will travel to. Um, also, regarding the issue of cost, there is um, uh, perhaps some overuse of PET scan, which is a technology that shows areas that are um, more metabolically active. A PET scan is a procedure where you give radioactive glucose and you scan the patient and you find out where that glucose is being deposited. Uh, in fact, um, in, a, in a very perhaps simplistic way, um, areas that are more active tend to eat more glucose, so you have more deposition in those areas. If someone um, is already diagnosed with having extensive involvement by lung cancer based on the CT scan only, I don't see any advantage of obtaining a PET scan as well to find out every single site that may be involved. The treatment is exactly the same, but it has become a, um, more and more uncommon to see patients that have not yet uh, one or more than one uh, PET scan, which is a, quite an expensive test. And finally, patients frequently will have also an MRI of the brain, and both PET scan and MRI of the brain are important when there is a consideration for surgical resection, because we don't, one does not want to submit a patient to a fairly large surgical procedure when in fact they have more advanced disease than can be cured with surgery. So that's the distribution by um, um, staging and the most common therapeutic approach that is used in each of these stages. So there is no question that for patients with stage one and two, the therapy of choice is surgery. And as uh, I'm gonna touch briefly um, in the near future, this can be followed by chemotherapy. Some patients that have a more limited involvement of the mediastinal, can all, this space between the two lungs, can also be considered for surgical resection that um, almost always include a combination of some type of systemic treatment due to the risk of the disease returning other areas of the body. And that's the goal of this chemotherapy, try to eradicate those cells that may have escaped from the um, original area. Patients with stage three are also treated with chemo and radiation therapy. And, and finally, patients that have stage four or very extensive stage three B that really cannot be fit in one reasonable radiation field are treated with systemic chemotherapy only with the goal of uh, palliating their symptoms and extending their lives. So this is a, uh, obviously a cartoon of the lung. And as you can see, we have three uh, lobes on the right, two lobes on the left, and the standard surgical procedure is the removal of the entire lobe. If that is really necessary nowadays, when some patients are being diagnosed uh, with relatively small tumors, is unclear, uh, but the standard surgical therapy is the removal of an entire lobe, an entire section of, of uh, the lung. One uh, very important message, and I guess that's a bit for um, us here, uh, in a way, is that uh, um, one of the hidden secrets that people don't talk much about, but as you can see, that has been described and published at the New England Journal of Medicine, is that it's very important where you get your surgery. Um, here you have uh, data from Medicare, and uh, these survival curves indicate patients that were operated by surgeons that perform between one and eight lung cancer surgeries per year to as high as 67 to 100 lung cancer surgeries per year. And as you can see, there is an enormous difference in outcome in survival at five years that may be close to 20% point difference um, in the outcome. So it is very important to have surgery for lung cancer 
with someone that does and does often. How do we evaluate the patient prior to surgery? Um, Patients have a surgical risk, which include a cardiac evaluation when that's indicated, and pulmonary function tests to evaluate uh, a pulmonary reserve to see if they are able to tolerate the removal of one of those sections uh, of the lung. Let's talk a, a little bit about screening. Um, as, as you know, uh, there are a lot of areas in oncology where screening is quite well established. Um, I guess the reason that uh, not as many women die of cervical cancer nowadays, it's because we have very effective way of screening that. And obviously mammograms have a clearly established role uh, in the screening for breast cancer as well, as well as colonoscopies for uh, the screening of colorectal cancer. However, in lung cancer, it is uh, uh, quite a controversial subject. Um, this is a relatively recent paper that was uh, uh, published at the New England Journal of Medicine. This is not a randomized trial. This is uh, the outcome of patients that were enrolled in a screening program which included a CT scan done every year. And as you can see here, the survival of patients that were diagnosed with stage one disease in this screening program was 92%, so extremely high five-year survival, if you got diagnosed through one of these screening programs. Well, how does that compare with the five-year survival of patients with stage one disease? Well, patients with stage one disease have a five-year survival of approximately 60 to 65%. So this seems a lot higher than what happens outside of a screening, which then would prove that screening is a good idea. Well, that's really not true. That is a little bit of a leap of faith there, because patients that are diagnosed with stage one uh, outside of a screening program, they are usually diagnosed by symptoms. And it's not clear if biologically speaking, um, Tumors that are diagnosed by random x-rays when the patients have no symptoms have the same behavior as tumors that are diagnosed due to symptoms. So uh, this comparison is probably not a fair comparison. But the fact is that there are a lot of screening programs out there, including at the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. I happen to believe, until proven otherwise, that it's likely that this will have a role was added to the controversy uh, the fact that um, the principal investigator on, on this paper, uh, actually someone quite famous from um, um, Columbia or NYU, NYU um, had received uh, a few grants uh, from the tobacco company. And the New England Journal of Medicine has a policy that it does not accept any publication that has any funding coming from the tobacco company. I mean, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but it did generate quite a bit of controversy around this uh, publication. Over the last five years, uh, we in fact have made some significant progress in the therapy of particularly non-small cell lung cancer. And those uh, advances were in the areas of adjuvant chemotherapy and in the incorporation of the so-called targeted therapies. So this is a, uh, one of the most important papers in, in lung cancer over the last uh, uh, few years. And it's a study led by the Canadians where they took uh, um, 459 patients that had had complete resection of their uh, lung cancer and they were randomized to either received combination chemotherapy or no additional treatment. The treatment was fairly well tolerated, as you can see by the percentage of, of severe toxicity that we have the, uh, in the table there. And as far as survival, so the strategy here is the surgeon removes every disease that is possible to be found by CTs and PET scans. But I just told you that even in stage one, 
maybe 35% of patients will have recurrence of their disease. Well, how does that happen? The tumor has been entirely removed. Well, it happens because there is something called micrometastatic disease, which are small nests of cells that get into the bloodstream, and they are hiding somewhere, and eventually they come back. So the idea here was to give chemotherapy to try to eliminate those small nests of cells that may be hiding somewhere. And the results of the study, as you can see there, the median survival measured in months if the patients had not received any chemotherapy, only surgery, was 73. And if they had chemotherapy, was 94. Perhaps more important than that, the overall survival at five years was improved by an absolute 15 percentage points from 54 to 69. And uh, as far as adjuvant therapy, if these numbers do not impress you, then there's nothing else that can be done because this is as good as it gets in terms of adjuvant therapy. If you compare with adjuvant therapy for breast cancer or adjuvant therapy for colorectal cancer, these uh, percentage improvements are certainly uh, comparable with these well-established approaches. And these are just the survival curves. Uh, as you can see there for um, recurrence-free survival and overall survival, the curves tend to separate relatively early and they remain separated for most of the follow-up. However, one of the issues in the delivery of adjuvant therapy is that, uh, I don't have a pointer, but uh, if you look here, uh, let's say, for example, that a patient has stage 2 disease. The chance of cure with surgery alone is uh, somewhere in the range of 40 to 50 percent. Let's say 40 percent. That means that in this side here, 4 out of 10 patients will be cured with surgery alone, while 6 out of 10 will have recurrence of the disease and eventually will die of lung cancer. Then you have some very effective adjuvant therapy, which increased the chance of cure from 40 now to 50%. That's fantastic. I think that almost every patient and every doctor would be more than glad to give adjuvant chemotherapy with these kinds of odds. However, we have to remind ourselves that if we treat everybody with adjuvant chemotherapy, there are four patients here that, that they didn't need it because they were cured with surgery. But they're still getting chemotherapy, and they're going to have to deal with the side effects of that. There are five patients that unfortunately will get chemotherapy, but the disease is still going to come back and for the most part end up killing them. But there is this one patient here that was destined to have a recurrence, and now it's not going to have a recurrence anymore because the micrometastatic disease was eliminated. So ideally, we would have some biological testing that would tell us who is this patient, because he or she definitely needs chemotherapy. We would then turn to this four and say, yes, you have stage two disease, but you're cured. Don't worry about it. Go live your life. And these five patients would be candidates for clinical trials, because we haven't found an answer for them, and we need to. But unfortunately, we're not quite there yet. So we treat everybody in the hope that uh, we will benefit uh, this person here. Now well, let's uh, change gears a little bit, and let's talk about the treatment of advanced disease. So this is a trial, and obviously, I don't want anyone to focus on the chemotherapy agents. But in this trial here, the patients were treated either with conventional chemotherapy or they were treated with conventional chemotherapy with an agent that blocks the formation of new blood vessels. And it led to a two-month improvement in median survival from 10 to 12 months. And after one year, there were more 8% of patients that were alive because of this. And this led actually to the approval of this antibody that blocks the formation of new blood vessels. One problem, though, is that this antibody costs $8,000 per infusion, and it's given every three weeks. Um, most patients receive approximately six infusions, and then they are continue on therapy until evidence of disease progression, which makes into an extremely expensive uh, proposition. 
Another advance in uh, the therapy of patients with uh, um, metastatic or disease that has spread um, is targeting the ephemeral growth factor pathway. And that, that's a normal pathway. It's a receptor that sits in the uh, surface of most epithelial cells, in our mouth, in our guts, in our lungs. And normally, it stimulates uh, normal controlled cell growth. But it can become deregulated. You can have too many receptors, too many ligands, uh, receptors that start firing inside the cell and telling them to grow irrespective of having a ligand. So this mechanism may become deregulated, and then you have uh, uh, tumor growth uh, or in the formation of malignant tumors. There are actually um, a few compounds that block this pathway. And this is an example of uh, uh, the first trials of one of such compounds, uh, which is a pill, actually, that blocks the formation, um, that bo blocks this uh, pathway called the epidermal growth factor pathway. And as you can see here, this patient had a very large tumor located in this area here between uh, the ribs and the heart. And this is the image after being one month on the pill, and that's the image 12 months on the pill. So the tumor is almost completely gone. So we were part of this study of a drug called erlotinib um, for the treatment of patients that had already received prior chemotherapy for their advanced disease. And that's a pill that you take uh, every day. As a side note, it costs $4,000 per month. Um, so each pill is uh, about $130. Um, so I always tell my patients that they should never uh, take the pill in the bathroom because if it takes an, it takes an unfortunate bounce and ends up in the uh, toilet bowl, um, it's a lot of money in there. Um, so patients that had received already at least one prior line of chemotherapy were randomized to receive this pill or to receive placebo. And um, the treatment is actually fairly well tolerated. The most significant side effects of the pill are the development of a rash that looks a little bit like acne, and we're going to have a picture of that, and diarrhea. And all the rest is actually uh, both rare and not that severe. This is the rash. Uh, you can have a fairly mild rash uh, here, um, a more significant rash, and this type of rash that really has some negative impact on the patient's quality of life. Fortunately, this uh, more severe rash happens in about 9% of patients treated with this drug. Which is not entirely understood is that the benefit seems to be um, restricted to patients that do develop some rash. That doesn't mean that everybody that gets the rash benefits from the therapy, but if you don't get the rash, then you don't benefit um, from this therapy. And um, it, uh, remember that I told you about this antibody that improved the survival by two months from 10 to 12? This is a, a different stage on the natural history of patients. Here they have already received one line of therapy. And it also led to a two-month improvement in median survival with the administration of this pill. And I can see that some of you are already getting a little uneasy on your chairs with all these improvements that are numerically relatively <laughs> small. But I will postulate that uh, it's highly unlikely that we're going to come up with one therapy that will dramatically change uh, what happens in lung cancer. We're going to get better by small blocks that we're going to build one on top of the other. But as it turns out, this therapy is actually a major improvement to a, about 10% of patients with lung cancer. And that is because they have a mutation of that epidermal growth factor receptor gene that makes them much more sensitive to uh, uh, this pill. Like that first scan that I showed you of a patient that uh, had almost complete disappearance of the tumor. So we, uh, working with a, a group at Massachusetts General Hospital, or I should say, yes, we working with them, conducted this uh, phase uh, uh, two trial 
of using one of these oral inhibitors of the demogorgon factor receptor for patients that were prospectively determined to have a mutation of the epidemical factor receptor. And there are some clinical characteristics that predict for a higher chance of having such mutation. And they are four, non-smoker, adenocarcinoma, female gender, and uh, Asian descent. Here are the response rates, the percentage of patients that had tumor shrinkage uh, if they are treated with this pill. This is the only therapy that they are receiving for the lung cancer. They have not seen any chemotherapy. This is initial therapy. And as you can see here, almost every single patient had control of their disease. And in fact, many of them had substantial shrinkage of their tumors taking this pill. I told you that the median survival of uh, lung cancer with this antibody but that blocks the formation of new blood vessels uh, was 12 months. This is also first-line therapy here, and the median survival was 17.5 months with a pill versus chemotherapy. And I would like to close um, by um, uh, showing you slides of a patient of mine. So this is a woman that uh, uh, developed some neck pain and, and a cough that would not go away. And this is her CT scan, um, which showed the presence of this quite large mass uh, located uh, close to the entrance of the right lung. And that's her CT scan, uh, about six weeks of being on the pill. Again, no chemotherapy whatsoever. Um, I think we can all agree that uh, this is as close to the complete response as, as it's uh, humanly possible. Not only that, uh, the reason she had neck pain is that on the top of her uh, thoracic spine, she had quite of a destructive lesion of uh, uh, a vertebral body. So normally this here would be all bone looking like this, but as you can see here, there is a big hole, and that hole is the tumor that ate up the bone in that area. And that's her most recent CT scan. As you can see, not only the tumor is gone, but the bone was reformed in the area. Um, and currently, she feels great, has absolutely no symptoms of lung cancer whatsoever, and uh, is taking a pill every day. So in conclusion, um, it's uh, likely that the number of lung cancer patients uh, uh, that are being cured of their disease is increasing due to the administration of chemotherapy after surgery, uh, as well as uh, perhaps uh, better use of these target agents. And they are assuming a progressive, more significant role in the therapy of the disease. And for patients that have this specific mutation of the epidemical factor, the disease has changed completely. Um, and it's uh, actually very rewarding to be uh, a lung cancer doctor at this time. So with that, I will close on time. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. I think we have a couple of microphones. I have two questions. Okay. Um, women have been getting pap smears and mammograms from a campaign of annual exams for some time. Is there any such plan for testing for lung cancers? So again, there are um, a number of places that are offering screening for lung cancer. There is a very large national trial, which we don't know the results yet. Maybe over the next uh, two years, we'll know the result. And that will be obviously very important information. If it turns out that uh, uh, this large uh, trial is a positive trial, showing that patients live longer if they were diagnosed uh, through screening versus not, um, then you'll see that becoming more and more common. But it's important to remember that this is really something that is restricted to patients that uh, have a significant smoking history. There is no evidence that a non-smoker should get a CT just to make sure that they don't have lung cancer. Um, and my second question as someone who's had this surgery mm -hmm. is, 
is there, you, didn't, you mentioned a lobectomy as the treatment of choice in a surgical presentation. Mm -hmm. um, I underwent a VATS surgery for mm -hmm. my lung cancer. Yep. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so uh, a VATS lobectomy, it, that doesn't change what kind of resection is done. Uh, it's still the removal of a section of the lung. But it's, it would be the equivalent of laparoscopic surgery. So it's done through cameras with much smaller incisions in the chest wall. You know, normally uh, the uh, surgery is done through spreading of ribs, which can be associated with uh, discomfort. Um, uh, and uh, patients with, <laughs> the patients are sleeping while we yeah. do this. <laughs> just, just be sure you understand that. Uh, yeah, but something tells me that if your ribs get moved around, you still hurt after you wake up. <laughs> yeah, you, you do, you do. Um, but uh, the recovery time, uh, supposedly, uh, although this has not been documented in a randomized trial, is shorter with a VATS lobectomy. And you can do the same type of, uh, of oncologic surgery that is necessary through these smaller incisions uh, versus an open chest type of procedure. Well, FYI, I'm one of the... 20 out of 100,000 women who never smoked who mm. had a lung cancer. So yeah. it's supposedly four years out, completely cured now. Excellent. Thanks. So I'll, I'll repeat the question. Um, the question is, uh, among those patients that uh, um, have uh, lung cancer and non-smokers, is, is there a possibility that that's genetically determined? In fact, there are some cases of genetic uh, determined lung cancer. They are extremely rare. That doesn't mean that, uh, well, I should say, we think they are extremely rare. In fact, everything is controlled by our genes. So this is not some type of Las Vegas phenomena that you know someone has bad luck and gets lung cancer. It's all controlled by our genes. Um, we actually have uh, 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 one case um, that it's very difficult to imagine that it's not uh, genetically related, but we have not been able to find the link yet, although we are working hard on it. Why prevalence rates in females are so much higher? Um, I know that some autoimmune diseases, women, well, show. So one of the possibilities is that uh, uh, estrogen levels uh, may be associated with that. We know that women tend to be much more sensitive to whatever factor leads to lung cancer. So for example, smokers, you know, pack by pack, women are much more likely to get lung cancer. Um, why that's the case for non-smokers as well, you know, perhaps the same type of mechanism that generates the process ends up being potentiated in women as well. Is there any, um, are there any studies that you know of that uh, follow immune dysregulation on both the over and under regulation in women? Well, so, you know, the, I guess the, the, the prototype of, uh, of uh, immune deficiency leading to the development of cancer uh, that we see in our practices are HIV and the post-transplant setting where you have to keep the patients immune suppressed. And in both cases, there is some increase in the risk of lung cancer as many other cancers that can happen uh, as well. There is a lot of work in trying to potentiate someone's immune system to help them fight the cancer, but that's a, that's a three hour talk. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.